The psalm assigned for today is Psalm 23, and we use the words of that psalm as our liturgy this morning. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I want so much, Lord. I desire so many things that promise to make my life easier, fuller, or more exciting and meaningful. And yet the things of this life do not provide the fullness of life. Give me wisdom to know my wants from my needs. Give me eyes to see the fullness of my life in you. Give me a heart that is willing to journey with the shepherd. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Because of you, Lord, my life is fertile. You planted the seed of faith in my heart and caused it to grow. Everything in my life, the joys, the sorrows, the worries, the discoveries, have been embraced by your love and contributes to who I am today. 
He leads me beside still waters. Although there is turbulence in life, your spirit fills me with peace and calm. There is a stillness that you provide when I find myself navigating troubled waters. Protect me from fear, worry, and anger when life becomes threatening, that I might enjoy life as you intended it. He restores my soul. Lord, when circumstances of life threaten to defeat me, you offer healing to me. Even if I question your presence in my life, or if worry overwhelms me, and I wonder if I can go on, you refresh my soul. In time, you breathe new life into me. You fill me with so much of yourself that the world simply becomes the place where I come to know you. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. When I look back at my life and see the choices I have made, I stand humbled and acknowledge your guidance. I seek your wisdom as I face each day. I ask that you journey with me one step at a time. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Challenges will come. They will threaten to take my breath away, but your breath remains. Your spirit guards my life. You give me hope. You give me peace, and the warmth of your sun brings a smile to my heart. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have invited me to a party in your honor. There is a place for me at your table and in your kingdom. With all the faithful Lord, you have welcomed me to break bread with you and confess my faith in your love. Those who ridiculed me because of my faith will see your glory in me. Let them see it now so that they might take their place at your table also. You anoint my head with oil. You have chosen me, Lord, for a holy purpose. You have gifted me to perform your work. You have called me to do your will. Convict me with your spirit so that I might never betray you and assure me of your forgiveness in the event that I do. My cup overflows. The words of my mouth are attempts to express what cannot be spoken. My life is so full, so rich, that only my heart can sing the praise you deserve. In my greatest moments of emptiness, Lord, you fill me up. Fill me now with your truth, your word. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. It doesn't matter where I live, where I work, where I travel, or who I'm with, or how long I walk this earth. If I bring you with me, my journey will be blessed. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. May my life be a prayer. May my life be a witness. May my life be a confession of faith in you, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
Good morning, everyone. It is Sunday, October 11th. We are glad that you have joined us. It is gloomy outside, but warm in here because you are here, albeit through technology. So welcome. We begin announcements this morning with two things that need um, your prayers. The first is to mention the rosebud, which is behind me. This is in memory of Mike Windsor, who died earlier this week at Forsyth Medical Center. And so we remember his family, his children especially, and are thinking about all of those who loved Mike and held him dear. We also um, want you to know that Marsha Hansley is back at Forsyth Medical Center, and Marsha and her family are also asking for your prayers. Um, I'd like to let you know that we have half a dozen new care note topics that have been chosen especially for these trying and difficult times. And so topics like giving your worries to God, finding peace in the present moment, and responding to life's challenges that are out of your control are subjects that are dealt with in these care notes. Um, I will be sending out many to our homebound um, congregation members, but if you would like one for yourself or to pass on to someone who needs a note of encouragement, please call the church office and we will get those out to you. Now, other items of um, events that are coming up, the Shred event on the 17th, and that is from 9 to 12. This is sponsored by the Advent class, and I don't know how they'll be using the funds from this event, but I can tell you that they have funded many great projects of ministry in this church for years, and by getting rid of some of your paperwork, um, that will be helpful to you. It will help the Advent class to raise money, and that will help our church and its ministry efforts. Also, don't forget the blood drive coming up, and all of them, in, information about all of these events and more is on our website or our weekly um, newsletter. Um, I am still looking for your Christmas stories for our Advent devotion guide, Good Tidings, and your Christmas memories, especially those around ornaments or decorations that you remember fondly or that you cherish to this day are welcomed, and I'd love to have those in the next week or two. Now, information from our joint board. The joint board has decided that in order to abide by the directives of New Philadelphia's rules and regulations, we will be having the required congregational council meeting by Zoom on Sunday, October 25th at 5 o'clock. At that time, we will establish a date within the first quarter of 2021 for a church council meeting to vote on the nominations for our boards. Over the next two weeks, please watch for more information and details concerning how you can take part in that meeting. Also from our boards, this exciting announcement, next Sunday, we will be taking another step toward opening for in-person worship. We'll be accepting reservations for a limited number of people that will allow us to follow the safety guidelines that we have established. Starting tomorrow, you can visit our website, newphilly.org, for more information on how to be part of that. And at the conclusion of our service this morning, you are invited to write in the comments section any questions that you have, and Pastor Gray will try to answer those in person. You can post your questions in the comments section during the postlude. Now, I'm going to introduce our mission moment. Um, this morning, we feature the Winston-Salem Street School, which our church has, um, has supported for the last five years. The street school in the heart of downtown Winston-Salem does work that is truly unique. They are giving at-risk youth another chance for a high school diploma. And some of the challenges, challenges that these students face truly are um, are almost overwhelming, but many still are able to graduate with that diploma through the family that has come to be known as the Winston-Salem Street School. So now tune in and we're going to show you a video that tells you more about this great organization and ways that you can help.
Yeah, I think a lot of times the students feel either unimportant or just a number in the, the larger public school system. We know their, what makes them tick, um, and we know how to just continue to encourage and to get them to the place where they are able to just encourage themselves and don't need that as much external. It's, I think it's better. I've seen, I've seen improvement in everything. So that's the biggest thing, the therapy that comes with poetry and them finding out that all you got to do is write it down and get it out and release it. Um, but we're not going to talk too much. we got to get started. So we're going to say what? What? Say what? What? So David said he's going first. David, come to the front. Y'all make some noise. Y'all make some noise. Y'all make some noise. Y'all make some noise. You can't get your voice out of the way that people really will feel the grasp of what you're trying to say. It gives people like me that are shy and don't usually want to stand up in front of people and read what I wrote a chance to do that and motivation to do that. Some of the kids who wouldn't normally speak up, they begin to speak up and find a voice. But then on the other end, the other students being able to hear what the peers are going through. And I think it breaks down a lot of walls. I think it's therapeutic. Um, and then now it's something we do on a weekly basis and they look forward to it. Our staff, our faculty really makes a concerted effort to reach out to them to be that family and uh, to be their family, I guess, away from home. But, um, but really it's a, a way that we can create a bond with our students so we build that level of trust with them and, uh, and they feel at home when they're at the street school. Walking down and hearing all the applause at the end of the day, we want them to get their diploma, yes. But more importantly, we want them to be a productive, respectful person to other people, you know? And there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm looking forward to walk down that aisle and hear everybody claw me. Like, I just, I don't know, I'm just excited to start my career, my life ahead of me. To be successful and to be successful here um, requires certain things. And hopefully that would translate to them being successful in life. Letting everybody know that like, I could actually do it, all the haters and stuff like that, everybody said I couldn't do it, show them, prove them wrong. If we'd done that, then, then we'd done our job. Special thanks to our mission committee and to the tech team for sharing that mission moment with us. Two weeks ago, we used a liturgy to guide our prayers. And then last week, we used a portion of scripture from Philippians to guide our prayers. And today, our prayers are being guided by a hymn that we sing together. So let's sing the first verse, Jesus Makes My Heart Rejoice. Thank you, dear shepherd, for the joy that we have in you. We thank you for supplying all of our needs. God, we know that you ask us to care for each other as you care for us. 
And we lift up to you now many who are suffering, victims of violence and terrorism, people whose lives have been affected by storms and, and fires, people close to us who are suffering and, and grieving. We lift up to you the family and friends of our dear brother Mike Windsor. Bless and comfort us, gracious Lord and God. We lift up Marcia Hansley and Bonnie and Jerry Tucker. God, we lift up to you this morning our dear brother Arkin Stewart and family on the tragic loss of his grandson, Arkin III. In all of these circumstances, O oh God, we put our trust in you, trusting his mild staff always, I go in and out in peace. Trusting his mild staff always, Thank you, dear God, that our peace and our joy are found in you. Help us to live in the peace that you provide and share the joy that you give throughout all of our days. Should not I for gladness leap, led by Jesus as his sheep? Should not I for gladness Just a reminder that you can continue to support the ministries of New Philadelphia Moravian Church by mailing in your tithes and offerings to 4440 Country Club Road, 27104, or by visiting the secure giving portals on our website, newphilly.org. Let's pray. God, as tiny pebbles thrown into a pond cause ripples to move outward in ever-widening circles, May our love move from this place outward, expanding to embrace our neighbors, our community, our human family, and our world. May all that we do and say and live be a witness, be a prayer, and be our offering to you. Amen.
Our epistle reading this morning is taken from Paul's letter to the Philippians in the fourth chapter, verses 1 to 9. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. I urge Euodia and I urge Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you also, my loyal companion, help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. from Matthew's Gospel in the 22nd chapter. Once more Jesus spoke to them in parables saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call all those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again he sent other slaves saying, tell those who have been invited, look, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his slaves, maltreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. And we sing another version of that story. I cannot come, I cannot come to the grave, don't trouble me now, I have married. I have bought me a cow. I have bills and commitments that cost a pretty sum. Pray hold me excuse, I cannot come. A certain man held a feast on his fine estate in town. He laid a festive table and wore a wedding gown. He sent invitations to his neighbors far and wide. But when the meal was ready, each of them replied, I cannot come. I cannot come to that way, don't trouble me now. I have married a wife, I have bought me a cow. I have fields and commitments that cost a pretty sum. Pray hold me, excuse, I cannot come. The master rose up in anger, called his servants by name. 
said, go into the town, fetch the blind and the lame, fetch the peasant and the pauper, for this I had will. My banquet must be crowded and my table must be filled. I cannot come. I cannot come to the banquet. Don't trouble me now. I have married a wife. I have bought me a cow. I have fields and commitments that cost a pretty sum. Pray hold me excused. I cannot come. When all the poor had assembled, there was still room to spare. So the master demanded, no search everywhere, to the highways and the byways, and forced them to come in. My table must be filled before the banquet can begin. I cannot come. I cannot come to the banquet. Don't trouble me now. I have married a wife. I have bought me a cow. I have fields and commitments. Cost a pretty song, pray for me, excused, I cannot come. Now God has written a lesson for the rest of mankind. If we're slow in responding, may leave us behind. He's preparing a banquet for that great and glorious day. When the Lord and Master calls us, be certain not to say, I cannot come. I cannot come to the banquet, don't trouble me now. I have married a wife, I have bought me a cow. I have fields and commitments that cost a pretty sum. Pray hold me, excuse, I cannot come. Good morning and welcome to the children's time. Just a reminder before we start, Children's Sunday School is still happening this morning. Um, even though it's a little rainy, we will meet in the pavilion and via Zoom at 11.30, so come join in. So I want you to picture a family trip. Any car on any family trip, but certainly not your own. Are we there yet? I'm bored. I'm hungry, I have to go to the bathroom. Mom, she touched me, she looked at me first. Did not, did too. Can you picture it? Now I know you've never acted that out, but I'm sure you've seen it. Okay, so picture any two-year-old you've ever known. There is one word that rocks every two-year-old's world. In fact, it may be the very reason for their existence. Parents, grandparents, can you say it with me? With that one little two-letter word that is the essence of every two-year-old's existence, no. So, do you need to go to the bathroom? No. Take a bite of your vegetables? No. Time to get ready for bed? No. Do you want some candy? No. Wait. So let's go back to that car ride. Remember, she touched me. She looked at me first. Did not, did do. Freeze. Right there. In your mind, turn your focus from the back seat to the front seat. Think about your parents faces, mom, dad, whoever, what does that parent's face say? Those two kids could have been named Yodia and Syntyche, like the women who were fussing with each other in the Philippians passage this morning. As a matter of fact, you could know both sets of people in today's scripture lessons and not realized it. That two-year-old who says no to every request, even the offer of candy? Why? Just because, so that he or she could show that he could do just what he wanted, when he wanted. That sounds a lot like the folks who were invited to the wedding banquet, thrown by the king, and even though he invited them to a big party with food and music, they said no, to show that they could, just because they could, and that's often the way we turn away from God, even when he knows, we know that what he's offering us is good, just to show that we can do what we want, when we want. 
and those two kids in the car fighting with each other just for the sake of annoying each other. Like the two women from Philippians on just about any given day with whoever we might be fussing with, do we see ourselves? Now freeze and picture God's face. Just like the parent in the front seat of the car with those fussing, fighting kids, and still, he loves us. Those parents in the front seat still love those fussy kids that are sitting in the back, even though sometimes those kids drive them crazy. The parents of that two-year-old no child love him dearly even though they wish sometimes that he'd forget the word no forever. And so it is with our God. I bet sometimes God's face resembles that parent in the front seat, that had it up to here parent face, but he loves us and he will always love us and hold us close and be here when we need him. So today, Instead of making our Heavenly Father crazy and looking like that front seat parent, how about if you and I and all of us, kids, adults alike, work toward making God smile? He tells us just how to do that in Philippians chapter 4. He says, choose to be happy. Choose to be gentle. Ask him for what we need and choose peace. It looks like the key words are choose and ask. In other words, it's up to us. So let's choose to make God smile with the way we act today and always. Amen. It may be because I don't see a lot of faces when I look out in front of me and Every Sunday morning when I, when I look over this way, I always see my brother and at least one of my sisters. It may be because of that that when I'm preparing for the sermon on Sunday, I often have these flashbacks to our childhood. I've shared some of them with you here. But this past week as I was reflecting on the parable of the wedding banquet, I remembered how our mom always emphasized the difference between can and may. I would ask my mother, Mom, can I go to Ben Bagnell's house? And she would reply, I don't know. Can you? Are you able to walk across the street and up the sidewalk to his door? Sam, I think you mean, may I go to Ben Bagnell's house? She always had to make the point that what we can do and what we may do and what we cannot do and what we may not do are not always the same. Of course, there's also a difference in what we can do and what we will do. We sang a song about the wedding banquet, I Cannot Come. We sang that song growing up, but mom probably wanted to correct the songwriter and say, it shouldn't be I cannot come, it should be I will not come. Because this parable is not about anyone's inability to come to the banquet. It's not that they can't. It's that they won't. It's about choices. The choices that we are faced with in the kingdom of heaven. And remember when, that when Jesus tells these parables about the kingdom of heaven, he's not just talking about life after death, eternity in paradise. No, he's talking about living as citizens of God's kingdom right now on earth as it is in heaven. He's talking about what it means to give our full allegiance to God. 
It's no coincidence that this parable comes right before the passage where people ask Jesus about paying tribute to Caesar, about the way that we as followers of Christ view earthly authorities and, and how we balance being citizens of a nation and citizens of a heavenly kingdom. But we'll get to that next Sunday. In the meantime, though, what does it mean to be all in with God and to put God above everything else in our lives? What does it mean to let God's word and God's spirit permeate our actions, our words, our thoughts, our finances, our relationships with each other? How do we say yes to God's invitation to the banquet that God has prepared? And what does God expect of us as guests at that banquet? Well, let's see if this parable can help to shape or inform our answers to these questions. It's a pretty simple, if at times troubling, story. A king gave a wedding banquet for his son. Now, it's pretty easy to figure out that the king would be God and the son would be Jesus. I am reminded, though, of someone who was doing a children's message, and she said, Kids, I'm thinking about something with a, with a bushy tail that gathers acorns and, and scurries up and down the branches of a tree. And one little boy raised his hand and said, I know the answer is supposed to be Jesus, but it sure sounds like a squirrel to me. Well, in this case, the answer is Jesus. And the idea or the, the premise of a king giving a wedding banquet for his son would not have been at all strange for the people listening to, to Jesus tell the story. It was the custom then and, and there that the father of the groom planned, prepared, and paid for the whole shebang. The father took care of everything, sometimes even the selection of the bride for his son. And it was a really big deal. Weddings could last for, for several days or even weeks. So you can imagine if this was a king giving this banquet, it would have been pretty amazing. And Jesus said, Jesus said that this king sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Not could not, would not. But it says the slaves were sent to call those who had been invited. In the original Greek, it says literally, they were sent to call the called. It uses two forms of the same verb. But what that means is that they had already received the invitation. The normal practice was to send out a, a pre-invitation, not, not a save the date, because the date wasn't set yet. They were invited, and they were told that they would be called or notified when everything was ready. So my point is that it wasn't just out of the blue. They had already been invited, and they must have indicated at least some interest because now they were being informed that everything was ready. But, or as our mom used to say, nope, not today. So the king sent other slaves and told them to tell the invited or called ones, look, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. I sent you the invitation. Now I'm letting you know that we're ready. But the invited ones, the, the called ones, made light of it and went away. They had other things to do. They had other commitments. Well, this would have sounded ridiculous to the people listening to the story. Not only is this an, an insult to the king, and it might get you in serious trouble, but how could you pass up this kind of opportunity? How often do you get invited to a royal banquet? And some of the invited ones even seized the slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. Now, I'm sure you've gotten an invitation in the mail that you weren't terribly excited about, but I'm also pretty sure that you didn't murder the mail carrier. And the king was enraged and sent troops to destroy the murderers. Notice they're no longer referred to as the invited ones, the murderers, and burn down their city. Again, you've probably had someone turn down an invitation that you extended to them, and you may have been pretty upset, but I doubt that you burn their house down. This all sounds really extreme. Yes, that's because it's a parable. And parables often use hyperbole, exaggeration, to make a point. So let's see what the point is. 
Well, the, the wedding banquet is still ready, but there are no guests. And the king isn't going to, to all of this effort just to put on a show. No, he wants the place to be filled with people. I, I know the feeling. He wants to share all that he has with anyone and everyone who is willing to accept his invitation. So he tells his slaves to go out into the main streets and invite everyone they can find. And Jesus makes it a point to say that they gathered all whom they found, both good and bad, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. Finally, great. But then things got, went south, as we say. Because when the king came in, he noticed that one of the guests wasn't wearing a mask. Oh, no, I wasn't wearing a wedding robe. And he asked him, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? The guest was speechless. And the king had him bound hand and foot and thrown out, out of the bright lights of the banquet hall and out into the outer darkness where there was weeping and gnashing of teeth. Those two always go together and it's never good. Well, there was something that always bothered me about this parable. So I did some digging and I found something that, that helped me and, and, and hopefully it might be helpful to you as well. What bothered me was that this poor guy accepts the invitation. He's not one of the, the pre-invited ones, one of the called ones, the ones who had gotten the initial invitation. So it was a spur-of-the-moment thing. Someone came up to him on Main Street and invited him to come, and he did. He may not have had time to, to change his clothes, or, or very likely he may not have even had any other clothes to change into. Definitely not anything that would be appropriate for a royal banquet. And then he gets thrown out because he doesn't have the proper attire. How is that fair? Whatever happened to come as you are or just as I am? Well, remember I said that the father of the groom took care of everything? He planned and, and provided and, and paid for the whole thing? Well, some scholars believe that in the case of royalty or with people who were very rich, paying for everything often included providing a specially made garment to be worn over a guest's regular clothing. This wedding garment was presented to the guest upon arrival. Refusal to wear it was an insult to the father of the groom. And wearing the garment was kind of like a great equalizer. It didn't matter if you came to the wedding in a tuxedo or in jeans and a t-shirt because everyone was covered with the same wedding garment, kind of like our gravestones in God's acre. So this helped me to understand that maybe the point of this parable is that, no, it doesn't matter who we are, what we have or don't have, what we do or don't do, because Jesus made it a point to say that the place was filled with both good and bad, they weren't just inviting good people because then someone would have to make that call. Someone would have to be the one to, to decide what defines good and who the good ones are. But that's not the way it went down. So this says to me that what matters, no matter who we are, no matter how good or, or how bad we are, what, ba what matters is not only our willingness to come to the banquet, to accept God's gracious invitation to the banquet prepared for his son Jesus, but also our willingness to be changed into his likeness. Yes, we can come as we are, just as I am, but we don't stay that way. We recognize that love so amazing, so divine, demands our soul, our life, our all. And the good news is that God provides all that we need. God provides the acceptable garment. But what does that look like? Well, back in 2007, I took part in the Unity Bishops Conference. It's held every seven years, and, and every province of the Worldwide Moravian Church is invited to send one bishop. Well, in 2007, the conference was held in St. Thomas in the Virgin Islands. I know it's a tough job, but someone had to do it. Provincial boards from all of the provinces were asked to send in agenda items or issues to be discussed. And one of the items on the agenda was proper attire for bishops. You see, in some provinces, bishops wear, Moravian bishops, wear purple shirts and clerical collars. 
In other provinces, they often wear a large cross on a chain. And in some, there are special robes, sometimes purple robes or red robes that they wear, while in many places, there is no specific expectation or, or requirement when it comes to clothing. But we were being asked to set a standard for the worldwide unity, and we were getting nowhere. Until one bishop opened his Bible and announced, I found it, I got it. And he read from another one of Paul's letters, the letter to the Colossians in chapter 3. He read, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. End of discussion. You see, the robe that God provides not only changes our, our appearance, no, it, it, it may change our hearts. It can and will change our hearts if we accept God's invitation to wear it. As Paul said, it gives us a joy that doesn't depend on outward circumstances. It gives people like Euodia and Syntyche the ability to be of the same mind in the Lord because it penetrates our minds so that we think about things that are true and honorable and just and pure and pleasing and commendable. It gives us a peace that passes all human understanding because it is the peace of God. And we have the peace of God with us because we have the God of peace with us. Well, good old Count Zinzendorf had probably attended some pretty lavish royal banquets. I'm sure he had his share of fancy clothing, but he recognized that none of that mattered at God's table, and his own righteousness would, would look like rags. He wrote, the Savior's blood and righteousness can be the only proper dress in which I dare approach the place where God shall judge our human race. Someone said that that's not a fashion statement, it's a passion statement. So the question is not, can we or may we? The question is, will we accept God's invitation not only to come to the banquet, but to be clothed in the righteousness and the justice of Jesus? Let's pray. God, we thank you for this invitation. We thank you that we don't have to be good. We don't have to look a certain way or dress a certain way. We thank you that you provide all that we need. Help us to be willing to accept your invitation and to accept also the invitation to have you change us more and more into your likeness. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
a reminder that you, if you have questions concerning some of the logistics for, for next Sunday, following the postlude, please just stay connected and you can post those, those questions and I will try to, to answer them. Receive the blessing of the Lord, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. In Jesus' name, amen. is monitoring the comment section so if there are any questions uh, just a reminder that um, tomorrow you'll be able to go on the on the website um, when I say tomorrow let me say that that would be after 8 15 when Rachel uh, gets here because she's the one that makes some of these things happen and you will be able to get more information there as well but basically you just need to um, register online or call the church office and we're going to do this as a as a step toward reopening but still as as i said within the guidelines that have been established by our boards and in a in a safe way eric are there any questions there how close to the start of the service can you make any reservations ah how close to the start of the service can you make a reservation um there is not a cutoff in time but i will tell you that there will be a cutoff in in numbers and, and I can't give you the exact number because the way we're set up, we have spots where, where if one person comes alone, they can be. If two from the same household come, they can be in that spot because they uh, live in the same household anyway. Um, so it, would be, it, it wouldn't be based on the time in the week, but it would be based on whether or not we have reached that capacity. And the regathering team has established some additional guidelines to, um, in terms of how you would be seated and in terms of how, um, where, the, where the musicians are and, and some of those details. And so you can rest assured that they are looking into the best way to, to do that. It's, I realized this as I was um, sharing the sermon today, that it's, it's not always just can we do this, but it's, it's uh, should we do this. And so we're looking at what would be the best way to, to proceed. But please just keep um, going to the, the website. You'll also receive um, through your email or even on the Facebook page, there will be notices posted keeping you updated. And we really look forward to, to um, taking this, this step. Like I say, we're not just all of a sudden opening up but we are taking a step in, in that direction. We ask that you would keep, um, keep all of us in your prayers as we try to do that in the best way. Any? What's the capacity? How many spots? The, the capacity, well, um, we have, we, um, 
the, the boards and the regathering team. The regathering team is meeting tomorrow to make the final decisions on this, but even though our capacity is about, I think, 93 spots, we're not jumping right into that, and so that will be, it will be fewer than that. I guess really the, the best thing I can say is if you're, if you're sure you really want to come, just go ahead and try to get your reservation as soon as possible, and, and we're going to look at, um, look at the numbers and look at um, how many are coming together, and, and try to make sure that we do this in a safe, safe way. I wish I could be more exact on the number. Do we have to wear masks? Do we have to wear masks? Yes, that has been established that, that during the service. Um, there will be um, guidelines also posted. Um, we will still have um, Brother Dave uh, responding as, on your behalf um, to, to the liturgy so that we won't all be, be responding and we will ask that, that you are wearing masks. We, I, when I'm not speaking, I will also be, um, be wearing a mask. For, ex for example, when, when Clyde is speaking or when Evie is speaking, um, just because it doesn't seem, seem fair that you all would have to, have to go through this, I have to at least pay, pay a little bit of my dues for that as well. There will be specific entrances and exits to use. Um, there will be people here, ushers, to guide you, um, so you won't have to guess. And, and I, I hate to, I, since we're having a meeting tomorrow, I hate to tell you one thing and then it changed. So just know that when you get here, there will be signs, there will be people, um, and hopefully it won't be rainy like today, who will guide you. But we will be using a specific entrance, and also you will be brought in. Some of you, now this is big, but some of you may not get to sit in your seat in the sanctuary i know that's um that that's that can be really important sometimes but um, you will be brought in here by um, ushers and then also when it's time to leave you will be taken taken back outside as well, will temperatures, be taken at the door? temperatures are, are not being taken at the door but on when you go to register it's going to ask you basically i guess it's the honor system that if you have a, a a, a, a fever or if you have a, a high temperature that you are asked not not to come if there's any doubt um well the team didn't say this but i will say this that if there's any doubt um i have one of those no touch thermometers so i will have it here in case that is needed will there be congregational singing for this first sunday there will not be congregational singing and i know that's uh, you know for well not only for moravians for for christians for for people um that can be kind of frustrating we will do our best up here to um to sing on on your behalf you will have a, a printed order with with all of the words but you will at least for this sunday and and as we go forward until things change be asked not to join in the singing so you can weigh you know if, if you're if you're at home and and um want to sing and shout out loud toward your toward your computer if you would just like to be here um with some other people around you you can prayerfully make that decision this week we are looking at um ways that the um ways that the band not not the whole band but but a small group that can happen in two ways um there are places um we are blessed with a, with a lot of space here and then also outside where a small group from the band could play. The band is also looking at um, um, producing some videos that can be used, similar to what the Bells um, did, and we are thankful for that. And I believe that is it. So, the peace of Christ that passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. Amen.